Welcome, and thank you for joining today's National Industrial Security Program Policy Advisory Committee meeting, also known as NISPAC. To receive all pertinent information about upcoming NISPAC meetings, please subscribe to the Information Security Oversight Office's Overview Blog at isu-overview.blogs.archives.gov or by going to the Federal Register. All available meeting materials, including today's agenda, slides, and biographies for NISPAC members and speakers, have been posted to the ISU website at www.archives.gov slash ISU slash oversight hyphen groups slash NISPAC slash committee dot html and have also been emailed to all registrants. Please note not all NISPAC members and speakers have biographies or slides. While this is primarily an audio conference, you're welcome to join WebEx with the link provided with your registration, as all available materials will be shared during the meeting on that platform. If you have connected through WebEx, please ensure you have opened the participant and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a private chat message to the event producer. Please note all audio connections are currently muted with the exception of NISPAC members, speakers, and ISU, who we ask to please mute their own lines when not speaking. If you are not a member of the NISPAC and would like to ask a question or make a comment, please hit pound two on your phone to raise your hand. If your audio is through WebEx today, you may click the hand icon at the bottom of your screen or send your question to all panelists through chat. Another option is to email your questions and comments to nispac at nara.gov and someone will answer your questions there. This is a public meeting and like previous NISPAC meetings, it is being recorded. This recording along with the transcript and minutes will be available within 90 days on the NISPAC Reports on Committee Activities webpage mentioned earlier. At the conclusion, a survey will be provided for feedback. If you would like to be contacted regarding your survey responses, please include your email in the comments block so the NISPAC team can get back to you personally. Let me now turn things over to Mr. Bill Fisher, the Acting Director of ISU, as well as the Acting Chairman of the NISPAC. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 71st meeting of the National Industrial Security Program Policy Advisory Committee. I'm Bill Fisher, the Acting Director of ISU. Uh, I'm also the Director of the National Declassification Center at the National Archives in my permanent position. I will now turn it over to my designated federal officer, Heather Harris Pagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will now begin attendance for the government members. I will state the name of the agency, then the agency members will reply by identifying themselves. Once I've gone through the government members, I will then move over to the industry members. After the industry members, I will then proceed to the speakers. ODNI. Lisa Perez present. Thank you. DOD. Jeff Spenninger, good morning. Good morning. DOE. Natasha Sumter is present. Thank you. Thank you. NRC. Good morning, everybody. Dennis Brady present. Thank you. DHS. Rich DeJosseran present. Thank you. DCSA. Matthew Roche. Thank you. CIA. This is Don. I'm present. Thank you. Commerce. DOJ. NASA. Good morning, everybody. This is Paul Simon for NASA. Thank you. NSA. State. Heather? Heather, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Matt Armstrong will yes. not be at this meeting. Thank you. Air Force? Annie Backus, Department of the Air Force. Thank you. Navy? 
Dr. Andrew Jones, primary. Robin Nickel, alternate. Thank you. Army? Good morning, Laura Acton. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn to the industry members. Ike Rivers? Present. Thank you. Derek Jones? Tracy Durkin? Present. Thank you. Greg Sadler? Present. Thank you. Dave Tender? Present. Thank you. Jean Dinkle? <coughs> Present. Thank you. Doug Edwards? <laughs> Kathy Andrews? Present. Thank you. Now I'll do a roll call for the speakers. Mike Fowler? Present. Thank you. Dave Scott? Present. Thank you. Mike Ray? Present. Thank you. Chris Heilig? Present. Thank you. If anyone else is speaking during the NISPAC that we have not heard from or we don't know about, please speak now. Hey, Heather, this is Don from CIA. Also, uh, as our alternate, Kelly is on the line as well. Thank you. We request that everyone identify themselves by name and agency if applicable before speaking each time for the record. For ICE's telework status update, starting in December, ICE staff will be limited to teleworking no more than six days of pay period. I want to remind the government membership of the requirement to annually file a financial disclosure report with the National <laughs> Archives and Records Administration, Office of General Counsel. Before a government member may serve on the NISPAC and annually thereafter, this must be done. The same form for financial disclosure that is used throughout the federal government, OGE Form 450, satisfies the reporting requirement. If there are questions, please reach out to me. Additionally, we have had a few changes to the NISPAC membership. As discussed during the last meeting, our prior chairman and director of ICU, Mark Bradley, was retiring uh, this summer. The Department of the Navy's primary member, Christopher Chrislip, has been replaced by Dr. Andy Jones. Laura Ogden is the new Army alternate member. State Department's primary member, Kim Bogger, and her alternate, Mike Hawk, retired and have been replaced by Kim Cologne and Janice Custard Lazarchik. Our new industry members are Doug Edwards and Kathy Andrews, replacing Heather Sims and April Abbott. Heather Sims was also the industry spokesperson to the NISPAC and has been replaced by the current NISPAC member, Ike Rivers. For those departed members, thank you for your contributions over the years. We look forward to continuing the work you have done with the new representatives. I will now address the items of interest from the June 5th, 2023 NISPAC public meeting. The NISPAC minutes from the last meeting were certified to be true and correct and were finalized by me on September 1st, 2023 and were posted to the ISU website on September 6, 2023. On October 5th, 2023, the ISU joint notice with the Small Business Administration discussing their regulation combining their mentor-protege program was issued. It re relates to joint ventures. Please see ICU Joint Notice 2024-TAC-01. Do any NISPAC members have any questions? Ms. Evans, is anyone raising their hand on the phone line or sent a question via chat? We did get a message um, that DOJ was present, Matthew Croson and John Skinner. But other than that, there are no questions. Again, you may press pound two on the phone or click the raise hand icon in WebEx. Okay, thank you. At this time, we will now introduce our, introduce our speakers for their updates. Mr. Ike Rivers, the NISPAC industry spokesperson, will provide the industry update. Ike? Um, first and foremost, thank you, Mr. Fisher, for hosting this meeting. Um, industry NISPAC looks forward to the collaboration that will come from this meeting. Um, before we get started, I, I want to say something that's very near and dear and sincere to me. Um, most of you know that uh, last month, um, right after I uh, was elected to be the spokesperson, I, uh, I uh, lost my mother. 
I want to thank this group of folks because many of you that are on this call reached out and sent flowers, prayers, and thoughts to my family. I'm doing the passing of my mother. I want you to know that it has really helped us during this difficult time. And it also showed me that our security community is not only passionate about what we do in the community, but passionate about each other. So thank you very much for uplifting me and my family. We will never forget this. Um, secondly, I'll, as uh, Heather said, I want to thank uh, our outgoing NISPAC members, Heather Sims and April Abbott, for their tremendous job they did during their tenure. Um, and in speaking of Heather Sims, as a spokesperson, everybody will agree that she was definitely a pillar um, for the industry and help open doors that were closed. Um, industry NISPAC will continue to lean on both of them for their guidance and the expertise that they've provided over the years. Um, also wanted to pass on a welcome to our newest members, Captain Andrew, Northrop Grumman, and Doug, uh, Doug Edwards from Raytheon. They both bring a wealth of knowledge um, to this already awesome industry NISPAC team. Before I jump in and to, to talk about a few items, I just want to say that the partnership between industry and government on all levels is steadily, and when I say steadily, steadily moving in an upward motion. We are constantly climbing this ladder when it comes to this partnership, which is tremendous and great for our great um, nation and national security. The collaboration has been awesome. Now, although sometimes we agree to disagree, the outcome has been all about what is best to protect this great country. So thank you all, thank you all for your continued partnership and we look forward to our continued growth to this strong partnership. One of the things that industry NISPAC would love to see moving forward is going back to the face-to-face -face meetings between ISU, the CSAs, and industry NISPAC. If there is anything the industry NISPAC can do to help facilitate this request, please just let us know. Um, I think, we think that this would be great for everybody. Um, industry NISPAC just has a few items that we want to address today. Um, I'll address these items and then I will open it up for any of the other industry NISPAC members for additional comments. Um, first item is the 847 OCI mitigation. Industry NISPAC is cautiously optimistic about the 847 um, OCI mitigation obligations. And we're looking forward to seeing and hearing a government plan. Industry NISPAC is also willing to review and circulate the plans to give the industry side um, of the changes to the acquisition process. Um, guidance such as open ISLs um, continue to be um, an, in, an issue for industry. Um, there's still a few that are out there um, that is two and a half years old. Industry is looking to see if there will be a better vehicle to get policy and implementation information out. Um, getting a more accurate timeline will definitely be helpful to us. Um, we all know um, that Indus is a, 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 a four letters that have been on our minds here for several years, but just came true to surface here recently as of 1 October. Um, we are moving forward with the Embis transition, but we do have a few challenges with the report process for large companies. Now, uh, Industry NISPAC and DCSA are working hand in hand. Um, DCSA, VRO, and the Embis team on this resolution. Understand without reports, it makes validating records extremely difficult, i.e. personnel reports. Got to understand without that report, it will be extremely hard to know who is who and what is what in the company. Um, this poses a problem um, for not only Vero, but for industry and the different services. Um, mind you, um, these large companies, you know, that has five to 10K folks, you know, that's really, really hard for those companies um, to, to see what is what. The smaller companies won't have 
is, is, is as much problem as the large companies, although those problems still exist with the small companies. Um, with the continued communication, um, we have been struggling um, with getting clear, detailed information um, from sites such as the DCSA website on M uh, implication, um, implementation procedures, system changes in a timely manner. Now, we have been working and will continue to work with DCA, DCSA with expanding on more communication avenues. Um, we do need to ensure that all communications are filtered down, not only for the large companies, um, but for the, the small mom and pop companies as well. Um, that information is critical um, to those small companies. Yes, the large companies as well, but I think a lot of times we forget um, that we have those small companies out there. Um, we have to, whatever we do as far as this communication piece, we need to make sure that it's easily and readily available for everybody to make things easier. Um, what I'd like to do now is um, just to say that we, Industry NISPAC, we're here to help, we're here to facilitate, we're here to, to do whatever it is possible within our means to collaborate to make things better. So if there's ideas out there from ISUS, the CSAs, anything that we can do to collaborate together, please let us know. The doors are open, we want them to stay open. We cannot do this alone. Um, our adversaries are getting stronger and stronger every day, and we collectively have to stick together, we, our team together, um, to, to, to fend them off on a daily basis. Um, what I'd like to do now is open it up to the rest of the industry NISPAC members to see if there are any additional comments. Hey, hey, do you mind if I go first? Okay. Yes. Who, yes. Uh, good morning, everyone, and um, like I said it best, it's, I would love to be in person doing this, and I think we all feel the same way. A uh, question I have this morning is in reference to the inside of threat, uh, the whole inside of threat process with industry and government. And, and one of the, and, and this is, a, I wish we were in person, but this is a question, not a finger pointing uh, event. I, I, so I hate, I hate not, not meeting in person. But we have, the question is this, is, and we, you know, we, I know this drum beats been drum before, is uh, uh, information sharing. On incidences with uh, people, art, you know, contractors, back and forth, uh, stuff that DCSA is aware of, or other, other government agencies are aware of, they don't share with us. You know, um, we, you know, it's reference to the briefing that we had in, with the Mantec situation, with the uh, shooting at one of their facilities, with information that was not received or um, communicated. And again, this is not a finger pointing. This is just, you know, request. It hang, as you know, it handcuffs the industry a lot. Um, everyone's concerned about something like this happen again. Um, so my question to you all is, you know, how to, to help us better our facilities, our companies, protect ourselves and protect you all, if we have government contractors going to government, is, is there any progress been made or any attempt that, you know, it's going forward, you know, there's a lot going on in reference to information sharing between industry and government? Someone's responding, their line may be muted. Hey, good morning. This is Jeff Spinninger. I'm sorry. Um, uh, and um, I, I think the, the hesitation in going on uh, is, is more a function of, uh, of, of uh, like I said, virtual, virtual challenges and not trying to step on anybody. So I wanted to wait a moment right. there. Uh, just to clear the comms. So, uh, so that's my way of saying I absolutely agree, and and uh, and hope that uh, this is the last of the virtuals. Um, um, <laughs> although I although my I do like the shoes I'm wearing better than the ones I would have to wear in, in person. <laughs> so, uh, but hey, yeah, <laughs> amen. Uh, so one, I, two, two things I have to say. Uh, the first being I I'm, I'm, I love the fact that there's a question. Uh, you know, frequently, uh, and I think uh, again, as a byproduct of us being virtual, these these uh, meetings uh, tend to be uh, transmit only uh, and and not a discussion. So uh, so happy for any question, even if it's a hard one, uh, which this one certainly is. 
Um, and so uh, to, with that in mind, though, uh, and, and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more uh, in, uh, when, when, uh, when I provide my remarks, but uh, information sharing, uh, you know, sharing, um, uh, it, you know, uh, is, uh, is, is, has definitely been a byproduct of, of a number of the challenges that we've experienced over the last uh, six months. The problem has, of course, been much longer than that. Um, there are some plans in work right now uh, to, uh, to to attempt to uh, reprise what had been done several years ago, uh, which is to tabletop uh, this to, to understand uh, what what information elements are, are required to be shared, and then addressing the hurdles uh, in sharing, uh, you know, uh, you know, a piecemeal. That is very much in the nascent stage. Um, if I could uh, put ourselves on notice here, I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, uh, to be phoning a friend here later today to my battle buddy Jill Baker, uh, who leads this up for um, for us in DoD, uh, find out where we are in the planning, and then um, and maybe uh, kick this over to 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 a working group one to, to give you all an update on what we are proposing in terms of trying to tabletop this at a at a policy layer um, and uh, and not continue to kind of grind on it at the uh, at the execution layer, right? Which is uh, Maybe something that we've uh, been attempting with with not a lot of success over the last um, yeah well for for quite some time uh, over. Hey hey Thank Jeff. You, hey Jeff, this is Ike. I really really uh, we really really appreciate that right because it's 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 something that the, the industry. Uh, acts all the time, you know, from the different agencies, you know, because um, we all know that each agency does their, you know, has a uh, a small portion of, you know, the things that they do that are different, and 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 it'd be helpful because most of us have companies, right, that that are involved in most of those agencies, right, and 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 that information sharing will help us get our folks through lines and processes and a lot faster. And in this particular case, it could it could help and save lives for that particular matter. So that information sharing is extremely important and, and you're and you coming on um, helping us try to navigate that and, and, and pass on that open communication to the industry will really, really help. Um, so thank you very much for coming on and saying and, and, and presenting that. Um, is there anybody else from the industry NISPAC members that would like to add an additional comment? Yes, I, this is Jane Dinkle. Thank you for the floor and hello everyone. Uh, I really wanted to mention reciprocity and um, in general, I want to acknowledge the success that we've had in the area of personnel security clearance reciprocity. There are a few challenges that continue, but in general, we do consider this an overall success story. Um, and we'd also like to see similar progress in the area of 705 standards and physical security requirements implementation for special program areas from agency to agency. So maybe we can add that to our work plan going forward to try to achieve the same level of success. Thanks, Jane. Anybody else from industry NISPAC? Well, Heather, uh, I think that is it for the team. I do want to leave with just thanking um, everybody on all avenues, um, the services, uh, the government, and everybody that has been involved with this partnership. It is getting stronger and stronger, and the more that we collaborate and get together, um, we just strengthen this great nation to be in a position um, to do great things and to be able to shield ourselves from anything that the adversary throws at us. Um, again, whatever industry NISPAC can do to continue to foster this great relationship, please just let us know and we're, we're there. Um, that is all from the industry side. Thank you, Ike. Candice, do we have anything in the queue? We have one person who's raised their hand. Greg Pannoni, please go ahead.
Greg, you're muted. Hold on one minute, Mr. Pannoni. Now, can you, re- can you restart, please? Sure. Uh, Greg Pannoni, Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. And I hope I'm not out of line, but can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Okay. Um, and, and I think Ike uh, Rivers really said it, but the overarching concept of partnership and collaboration, um, really appreciate what Jeff said about, you know, in the area of information sharing, uh, looking at a tabletop exercise. But, but what, what I wanted to really say in, in the context of all that with the collaboration and, and uh, addressing critical challenges, for um, to put a plug in, if my industry colleagues agree, um, to invite industry in as early as possible in the process. So the example of the tabletop, I think uh, inviting industry into a tabletop exercise uh, to uh, provide input on what the critical information that from the industry perspective would be uh, most necessary and useful would be an example of of that, what I'm trying to convey and perhaps not in a very articulate way. Um, So that was all I wanted to, to mention. Thank you. Ms. Evans, anyone else in the queue? There's no further people in queue. Okay, thank you. Mr. Jeff Spininger, the Director for Critical Technology Protection for the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, will give the update on behalf of DOD as the NIST Executive Agent. Jeff? Uh, Good morning. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Uh, Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, to uh, to participate in this. Um, before I begin my formal remarks, I, I just want to start by uh, by by offering uh, some echoes to, uh, to to some of what I shared earlier, uh, both in in, uh, in 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 wishing well and uh, and, and congratulating uh, Keith, Heather, and April on their uh, six completing their successful tenure. Uh, what's interesting is um, I, I think in the beginning, Mr. Fisher, you mentioned that there have been 71 NIST PACs um, uh, public meetings. I'm pretty sure that Keith has been at all of them. Um, and, uh, and has spoken at all of them. So we're going to try to figure out a way to entice him to, to chime in from uh, the cheap seats today. Um, uh, but, uh, but his stewardship uh, and, and, the, and the strong partnership that, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, that, that, that he had uh, and maintained uh, along with, uh, you know, the, that of Heather and April and, and frankly, so many others, uh, you know, has, um, is, is something that, uh, that we're all challenged, those of us who, who remain, um, you know, on the committee, uh, uh, you know, our, our challenge is to uh, to capitalize on their great work and uh, and continue to expand it. Um, so, uh, so with that, I would say uh, then welcome Mike, uh, Kathy, and uh, and Dr. Edwards. Uh, I want to make sure I get that right. Very happy to have you joining us. Uh, our phones are always open, uh, and uh, we are better for the collaboration um, always. So, uh, so I want to say thank you. Uh, uh, on, that, on that front. Uh, definitely want to offer a, a, an echo uh, to something else uh, that Ike said uh, with, uh, with advocacy of the face-to-face, right? So the, the awkwardness of the exchange from earlier today uh, just kind of highlights it, but, but also gives some promise. Uh, it, was, it was great to have a couple, you know, questions and some, some, some level of conversation uh, such as we're able to muster uh, when we're all distributed all over the place. Um, and so I think that's great, but I also think uh, there's an opportunity before I, before I dive in here uh, to highlight uh, again something else um, that w- that Ike mentioned, uh, and, it, and it does speak to formality, right? So that uh, that flow of information, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, particularly you know uh, you know while we we tend to spend a lot of time as uh, you know with uh, you know and, and are, are greatly connected both through uh, you know the NISPAC, uh, the the uh, various associations that are out there, great connections, great partnerships that are absolutely invaluable with uh, with those larger companies. Uh, you know, I, I do uh, take to heart uh, <clears throat> what what uh, what Ike mentioned. Uh, you know, about ensuring that we are, uh, you know, we're, we're we're able to cast the net as wide as we can possibly make it. Um, you know, to, to be able to reach, uh, you know, those, the, the, the uh, kind of what are the meat of the, 
the uh, industrial security program, which are, are companies that are, are, are small in size. Um, you know, uh, those are uh, the engine uh, that everyone relies on. Uh, I hear that all the time. Uh, not not always, frankly, as a as a as a as a function of of conversations on industrial security, um, but on uh, things like supply chain resilience. Uh, you know, NDS imperative, national defense strategy imperatives. Uh, you know that 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 absolutely underscore the 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 uh, the essential nature of a, of a, of a vibrant uh, supply chain for the department uh, and uh, and national security mission spaces. Uh, so all that uh, little soliloquy uh, is a, is a bit of an endorsement of the face to face, but it's also of the formality that comes with NISPAC, right? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm reminded anytime we do the prep here that everything we say is on the record and on the record is, is absolutely essential because that's where accountability comes from. So there's no shortage of collaboration as, uh, as has already been mentioned and, and I'm sure will continue to be mentioned and highlighted in some of the great work that I think is going to be reflected across the balance of the agenda. But it's that on the record piece of this thing that I, uh, you know, as I, you know, contemplate my own tenure um, that I think allows us to move forward uh, and, and, and take very challenging, contentious issues uh, where, where sometimes we're not all fully aligned, um, but when we're able to, uh, we're expected to, uh, to bring, them, uh, bring them to light, put them to discussion, and then follow up on them, uh, you know, through the stewardship of, uh, of ISU and the NISPAC, um, then we get that, we make forward progress and we get things done. Uh, and so with that, uh, you know, in, in considering, uh, you know, an in-person, you know, for future NISPACs, uh, I hope we will revisit, uh, and, and I, I can't miss the opportunity to mention, as I have over the last step, several uh, public meetings, the need for uh, probably increasing this, possibly increasing the frequency also for the on the record. No disrespect to the working groups, but it's the on the record stuff that, that holds us all to task, uh, and we're all able to measure uh, our progress and, uh, and, and note our challenges and then work through them. So um, with that, um, uh, uh, I'm happy for the opportunity to provide some updates on, <clears throat> uh, you know, a number of, uh, you know, uh, of those uh, same kinds of areas uh, where we have some some kind of weighty issues that we're working on, uh, and I'd like to provide some updates on that. Uh, the first one, first and foremost, uh, and uh, is uh, is with respect to um, the, the ability to use cloud uh, services in support of uh, NIST requirements. Uh, as many of you are aware. Uh, we have worked through several instances of direct contractor use of uh, cl uh, commercial cloud services to support uh, DOD contracts that require, uh, uh, you know, uh, access um, and, and utilization of um, classified information. As cloud becomes more prolific uh, in the NISP, and that, that, that is a bit optimistic at this time, but, but we are, uh, the gear is actually beginning to rotate, which is, I think, uh, absolutely essential. Uh, we are aware that there are continuing questions regarding requirements for how uh, to go about um, noting the permissibility for for the use of commercial cloud services on, on DOD contracts. Uh, to that end, um, and and with the tip of the hat to uh, to some some strong industry advocacy from uh, from from several companies, um, you know, who have many many classified systems, uh, you know, that uh, that are used to support, uh, you know, um, the department customers across the uh, across the defense enterprise. Uh, we have engaged with uh, with our counterparts uh, on the acquisition side of things in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment uh, to obtain some clarity on, on a couple of legacy DFAR clauses that relate to cloud. And I'm not going to rattle off the numbers here. Uh, most of you are familiar with them. Um, uh, we are we are looking to codify. We we originally uh, and aspirationally you know attempted to see if we could rescind them, say they were maybe overcome by events. Um, that is, that is uh, proved to be. Um, Maybe a, br a bridge too far, and there's uh, there's some some reasonable contracting reasons for that that I uh, I'm not going to embarrass myself and try to explain in a public forum, um, but suffice it to say I understand. On the other hand, uh, they uh, we we have gotten a greater guidance uh, uh, from our acquisition partners <clears throat> uh, that the they don't actually present an impediment at all. There's there's uh, uh, some clarifying um, there's some clarification that's necessary, uh, and that's something that we're working through right now. Um, the first and foremost, uh, you know, way that this will be um, um, observable to uh, NIST members will be through uh, the issuance of an industrial security letter. Um, it is uh, almost done. Um, um, I, I don't, I'm not a big forecast person, um, but we'll put ourselves out there. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistically, I'd like to see that. Uh, I'd like to say that we will, we will see it uh, 
before it turns to uh, 2024 on the calendar. Um, that's, that's certainly uh, within the realm of the possibility, uh, but it'll be the first one out of the shoot for us um, issue an industrial security letter under the the the, um, the, the uh, what is it for us a new process uh, mindful of of the NISPOM as a federal rule. But we think it's the right one to move forward with because it's a it's a pretty present issue, um, and so we uh, we will get that done here um, um, yeah, here in, in, in relatively short order, and I think that will make some headway. Uh, that's not going to get us done though, not 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 by a long shot. We're also working, um, uh, you know, very closely with uh, with uh, our counterparts at DCSA and and across the components regarding uh, to come up with common uh, acceptable documentation. Uh, we think that 254 is the right place uh, for this for, for all the reasons that the uh, DB254 exists. Uh, and uh, we're, we're looking to kind of streamline that so uh, to, to, uh, to anticipate, um, uh, you know, some consistency as, uh, as requirements for commercial cloud services um, uh, will, you know, continue to grow. And on this last point, and with a tip of the hat to, to, to frankly, to Keith uh, Miner, uh, you know, um, we were uh, you know, chatting earlier in the week, and he he proposed a, a simple, but in my estimation, brilliant, um, you know, additional step that we can take uh, that that one creates some affirmation of the of the authorization to use commercial cloud services, uh, but also something that we can get done pretty fast, and that is uh, without modifying the form itself, but mo but rather aiming at modifying the instructions uh, that uh, that attend to the form. Uh, all the fine print uh, that uh, that sits in those uh, in those back pages, uh, and noting the the permissibility of commercial cloud services within the instructions, uh, will be an important step. And so, uh, again, uh, you know, noting the dangers of forecasting, uh, I think it's a, it's a useful exercise to do this in this forum, and say that uh, we will uh, we'll endeavor to to move pretty fast on that front. Not quite ready to put a specific timeline to that, but I think it can be uh, quite quite aggressive. And so all of those are, um, you know, uh, to, to me represent a, a lot of uh, forward progress, and uh, and and uh, and this particular issue is, a, I think, a pretty good example of the value of NISPAC because uh, it has. We have been on the record as we've taken this journey. It has been an absolute partnership. Uh, we would not be where we are um, but for uh, some uh, some active participation from a number of companies, uh, you know, who are willing to. Uh, Take on some risk uh, and uncertainty uh, to work with uh, the government uh, and, uh, and get us to where we are today. So we're not done yet, but uh, but we are we are definitely closer than we have been. Um, so uh, the, the next one, and uh, Ike, you touched on this one. I'm glad you did. Uh, and that was uh, the discussions related to 847. Uh, just just to level set a little bit. Oh, sorry. Hello. We can hear you. Okay, uh, so um, 847, uh, it, if there was one part of my remarks where maybe it would be great if you didn't hear me, it would be this one. Uh, I'm, and I'm kidding, of course, but the um, uh, just just a level set, not, not sure who, who, um, who in the audience um, is completely uh, aware, but 847, uh, you know, comes to us from public law uh, 116-92 and expands and extends requirements for FOCI. Um, Modeled after uh, what what uh, what all the companies in the industrial security program are familiar with, it applies to companies who seek to perform on DoD contracts or subcontracts with a value in excess of five million dollars, including those contracts for which all the requirements required work is unclassified. Uh, requires DCSA specifically to conduct a FOCI assessment and possibly mitigate risks of FOCI of covered contracts for inclusion in the acquisition decision process. This po the policy, uh, um, we're, um, we're mindful of timelines on to this point, right? That is a, that is a major change, and uh, although modeled after, uh, you know, NISP requirements for FOCI, uh, it's that pre-award uh, aim point versus uh, the post-award process that we're all familiar with that, uh, that has caused us to be uh, quite deliberate as we, as we move forward. Um, but at the same time, uh, in, in saying that, this is a major and, and important shift in assessing this, the, the department supply chain in a pre-award versus post-award matter. And, uh, and, and again, it's, it's uh, you know, echoing some of um, what Ike said earlier. Uh, it's representative of the, uh, you know, evolving nature uh, of the threats we face, um, uh, you know, to deliver uh, warfighting capabilities that we can rely on. Um, God forbid we need them. Um, 
So with that, uh, mindful of that, that pre versus post, uh, we, we have been quite deliberate in this. I've reported this out before. We continue to do that. Um, the policy work that we're doing today uh, is in its final stages, right? To, to be quite candid, we are literally down to one unresolved uh, issue within the policy document, um, uh, which is um, a, 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 tr a tremendous accomplishment uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, tip of the hat to Alison Renzella uh, from my team for her doggedness. Um, uh, uh, Laura Agdon was working with her up until the summer, uh, and then uh, this just for the Army, and now Glenn uh, 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 Clay, who's just recently joined us uh, from the Navy. Uh, but there, we're we're in we're in the home stretch here, having to write some words uh, to to uh, to pass some legal muster, but we're feeling reasonably optimistic about where that uh, leaves us. This gets to the meat of the matter, and I think the request that uh, was perfectly reasonable and, and I think will be very helpful uh, you know, that came in, uh, you know, Ike, that you mentioned, which is the uh, the opportunity for, for being able to understand, uh, you know, what the rulemaking uh, that will come that accompanies, uh, you know, um, a, a shift of this type. Uh, and that's, uh, that's pending, so we'll take an action out of this uh, call today, uh, you know, in addition to what I mentioned earlier with, um, with respect to insider threat information sharing, uh, but we'll, we'll take an action to go back and, uh, and work with our ANS counterparts um, because the rulemaking should begin to move forward here and uh, in, in earnest. We have aimed for uh, what, what in policy uh, parlance is referred to as legal sufficiency review. Uh, we, are, we are possibly one email away from that process beginning, uh, and this is where then we begin the parallel, pra pra parallel track uh, into the rulemaking phase of this, uh, which is uh, you know, which will necessitate, um, you know, uh, certainly awareness by uh, industry, uh, our industry partners, um, but also, and, and more importantly, understanding uh, so we can all move forward and, and achieve what was expected in the, you know, by the, the purpose of the law in the first place. Um, so, uh, so with that, uh, we think that that's probably, again, something that, um, that we'll bring to uh, the clearance working group, uh, if that would be the right one. Allison just told me, and I can't remember what she said. So if I got that wrong, I apologize. But, but, um, but nonetheless, uh, we'll we'll be bringing that here. Um, we're we're just about at that point. Um, switching gears, uh, another another topic of some uh, some contentiousness uh, that that continues to play out, and that's with respect to uh, uh, the joint ventures, small business joint ventures. And so, with a tip of the hat and a thank you to ISU for publishing the notice on small business, uh, you know, um, the, um, and guidance on the small business federal rule, uh, we're, we're happy to have that. It represents some uh, some some progress on the issue. It's pretty complex. Uh, I, I, again, with a with a measure of candor, I've read the uh, the guidance several times, um, and it it, uh, it it it's helpful uh, in subsequent readings. Uh, we think we understand the intent. Uh, ultimately, for the department, we think it uh, it helps to complement and reinforce uh, what we intend uh, to to push over the line here uh, in the coming month or so, and that is a um, what we call a directive type memorandum uh, that will help to further clarify and provide guidance to uh, uh, to address the issue. Um, we uh, this. Um, um, uh, when when we're done here, the DTM will provide guidance for both uh, DCSA and DOD components on the process for joint ventures uh, that might meet criteria within the um, within the uh, uh, within the statute that established uh, you know where, where some of the ambiguities uh, or the the conflict exist. It will provide some guidance there to to be able to kind of meander through that without having to go and take the extraordinary step to request exceptions to policies related to the industrial security program. Uh, something which is a, an arduous and time-consuming process. It's sand in the gears. It slows things down, um, uh, and uh, and when we're slowing things down, uh, where where contract awards are, uh, that doesn't serve anybody's purpose. It certainly doesn't serve the departments, uh, and nor that of the uh, of this uh, in, in the small businesses that uh, that uh, frankly we rely on for the award and who rely on those awards in order to be able to uh, you know frankly operate. So. Uh, we'll continue to to, uh, to keep you posted on that one. We think that that will move relatively quickly once it clears the lawyers. Uh, everyone knows it's uh, it's important. I was uh, I briefed my leadership on on it most recently on Monday, and so, uh, so uh, that's that's where we stand um, at this time. Two uh, two other brief topics here to touch on. 
uh, it doesn't feel like you can go a week without saying the words trusted workforce uh, in, in, uh, in the next one another in a sentence. Uh, I made it several months without having to do that, and now we seem to do it all the time. Um, but uh, a brief update on the, on, on the department's efforts with respect to, uh, to 2.0. Uh, you know, the recent 45 day review uh, that, uh, that, that we undertook um, you know, uh, earlier in the summer and the subsequent follow on actions that the Secretary of Defense has discussed it for us uh, regarding security in depth, uh, you know, really became a uh, highlighted the importance of the ways in which we identify and mitigate risks, which brings us right to trust the workforce. The review uh, provided, um, you know, us with some data and result uh, in the form of, uh, that we were able to use to form recommendations uh, for policy, procedural, and, and candidly, uh, some cultural changes uh, within the department. Much of these focus, uh, mo much of the focus areas, uh, center around personnel security, uh, and uh, and line up pretty well, uh, are, and a bit of clarion calls with respect to uh, trusted workforce uh, efforts and aim points. The department's uh, trusted workforce 2.0 implementation efforts, um, um, like policy improvements, uh, continuous vetting, enrollment, elimination of PRs, have already led to significant measurable improvements in the personnel vetting processes. Uh, and um, uh, remaining initiatives like CV for non-sensitive public trust populations, shared services through DCSA, and continued focus on NVIS deployment uh, aim to increase efficiencies, uh, reduce burdens on the vetting process, increase overall workforce mobility. Uh, across personnel vetting domains, um, it, you know our 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 personnel uh, vetting counterparts are are working to evolve the department's methods for information sharing along these this same axis, right? So a nod to uh, to our earlier discussion and and some of the homework that we'll take out of today's meeting. Under trusted workforce, agency specific information uh, is forecast for incorporation from partner mission areas into continuous vetting, which will enable um, um, you know more uh, robust personal vetting and risk management. And finally, uh, along the same axis, trusted workforce, uh, you know, um, you know, the bumper sticker for us is it will better position the department to develop and maintain personnel ready, uh, you know, to protect our national security. And that's across the board, right? So, uh, you know, contractors, um, military personnel, and, and, uh, and of course, civilians um, as well. Uh, and finally, uh, the last topic that I wanted to raise today was, uh, was just to highlight uh, the, um, the, the second NISPOM amendment. Uh, it's uh, it's progressing is with our uh, it's pending approval now from uh, from our senior leadership uh, to be published to the federal register. Um, so we're within the workflow. It's uh, all pencils are down now subject to any questions from our leadership. We we anticipate it to be signed, um, you know, uh, whenever we're able to kind of cycle it into the to all the other things that uh, that our, our senior leaders have to contemplate right now in a in a pretty uh, topsy turvy uh, world stage. Uh, the amendment includes updated language on safeguarding, uh, offers some clarity with respect to open storage requirements, including procedures for leaving an open storage area unattended during business hours, and allows for delegation of open storage area approval authority for FSOs uh, if agreed to by the Cognizant Security Agency. Uh, all of these changes are reflective of recommendations that came in through the, the comments, uh, you know, which is a, um, a, a good and you know, open and transparent dialogue. Uh, ironically, once published, there's an opportunity to comment on the the amendments. Uh, so the process continues, and I, and I can speak for Allison and and uh, and now Glenn that they're super excited because uh, rulemaking is um, well, it's a uh, it's a process, and so uh, so, uh, but it is also reflective of the need for uh, you know continuing um, dialogue. Those those rules uh, become that common script that we all operate. Uh, you know, in terms of, and so making sure that we're getting the language correct uh, in a way that will hold up over time is uh, is important, and we need we need your help and assistance for that. Uh, with that, um, that concludes my remarks. Happy to answer any questions, or thank you very much for the uh, the opportunity to participate today. Thanks, Jeff. Um, any next pack members have any questions, comments? This is Greg Sadler. Jeff, can you elaborate on the last item um, you touched on regarding the open storage approvals? I just want to make sure I uh, capture that right. So, uh, other than the not not with a great deal of depth, to be very uh, frank with you, Greg, uh, I just know we had comments that came in uh, that, that looked for us to offer clarifying language that would uh, that showcase it is absolutely permissible. 
uh, for the for for open storage uh, open storage area approval authority to be delegated to a, a, an FSO, right? So um, pending the you know based on cognizant security agency uh, you know direction. So if uh, you, you know um, uh, so the, the, some level of documentation of that. So my, mindful of and thinking of DCSA coming in when they want to you know c conduct an assessment, right? Understanding what was permitted to be uh, left in open storage. Um, or left out, excuse me, um, uh, you know, would be su subject only to documentation. Um, I, I'm happy to take a note back, um, and uh, we can either uh, update my remarks when we um, when we when we go through this, just to be able to offer some more clarif clarifying language. Uh, and and of course, we're always available to uh, to provide uh, you know more detail um, offline. Although that won't serve uh, everyone else in attendance today. Thank I appreciate you, Jeff. it, Jeff. Thank you. You bet. Any other NISPAC members have any questions for Jeff? Hey, hey Heather, this is Ike. Yes. Hey, hey Jeff. Um, um, we I haven't seen, or I don't think any of us have seen the NISPOM amendment. Um, is that a possibility for us to to to, to see that? Uh, so, uh, if if the, if it is absolutely, uh, we will uh, we'll, we'll get it out straight away. Um, it's a, my normal answer would be to say just an unqualified yes. Um, I just want to make sure that I, I, uh, I hope you can appreciate. I want to preserve some decision space for my leadership uh, since we've made it through all of the coordination steps at this point. Uh, you know, and we're we're literally at the phase where we're just asking for a signature. I don't want to do anything that would upend that because it's taken kind of a long time to get here. Um, on the other hand, uh, if we're allowed to send it out as a draft, uh, we'll do so um, um, today. Um, and gosh, if we were in person, I would just sort of be looking kind of over my glasses at Allison, and she would probably be able to give us an answer right now. Um, right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you bet. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, this is Jane Dinkle with NISPAC, and I had a question about uh, the cloud services uh, and how we document those um, or, or the ability to use the cloud services. And you mentioned that you'd engaged with acquisition and they were updating or working on the DFAR clauses and um, that the, the ISL is almost done and we'll see that by January 1, or you said before the calendar hits 2024. And then you mentioned about Keith Minard updating the instructions to the DD254. So all of that will come out at the same time. Um, so probably not. So I, let me let me kind of reverse the order there. One, uh, you know, so this modification instructions. Uh, it, I, 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 to be candid, it was Keith's idea, but someone else has to do the work, um, and and he he specializes in that a little bit. But it's a great idea, and it's it's actually a pretty straightforward, uh, you know, thing thing to undertake. Uh, so I, 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 I'm hesitant to put a clock on that now, though I think, uh, you know, we'll be able to do so even, uh, you know, um, when the when the working groups uh, next convene here, if, if they meet in the month of December. So we should be able to have a clock on that. Um, with respect to the ISL, yeah, I, I'd like to hammer down on that one. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't, maybe I, I didn't touch on it with enough depth, uh, um, but the, 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 the process for issuing ISLs now requires us uh, in 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 a, in a good way, um, but we need to to uh, to make sure that we um, we get OP or OMB coordination um, before we move to uh, to putting an industrial security letter out. And so that is a, a wrinkle in the way in which uh, that 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 uh, that isn't the same way that we've done it in the past. And we're we're stepping through that right now, both so that uh, we uh, the royal we the department um, you know certainly you know coordination through NISPAC, but also uh, in this engagement with. Um, with OMB, um, we we can get uh, we can identify a repeatable process, and so we're uh, because ISLs are an important tool, as as I think has been alluded to. Um, so uh, we have a number of them in the pipeline. Uh, we went forward with all of them uh, back um, earlier in the fall, and I and I think maybe overwhelmed the system a little bit. The same time that we were also pressing with uh, OMB on the NISPOM amendment, and so what we needed to do was to kind of uh, sequence that out a little bit. Um, uh, certainly, uh, with, with deference to DCSA, if they felt differently, um, but for, for for my office, uh, this first one, uh, the cloud ISL, is uh, is at the top of the stack for us uh, for the reasons that I've already outlined. And 
like to see that go forward and um, and see it uh, teed up for signature this calendar year. Absolutely. Um, with respect to the DFAR, though, I want to make sure that there wasn't any confusion. There are no changes proposed for the two. There are two DFAR um, 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 uh, clauses that uh, that relate to uh, to cloud services. Neither one of which is proposed for change. Uh, because neither one of which uh, impedes the use of commercial cloud services in the NIST. What is necessary is for us to come up with some consistent language uh, and, and the mechanisms to note, you know, uh, and annotate the permissibility for the use of cloud um, as a, uh, uh, you know, on, on contracts requiring access. And that's what we have focused on at this point. Much appreciated. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, of course, thank you. All right, any other NISPAC members have any questions for Jeff? All right, next we will hear from Ms. Lisa Perez, the Senior Policy Officer for the Policy and Collaboration Group with the Special Security Directorate, National Counterintelligence and Security Center with the Office of the National, uh, with the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Lisa? Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Heather. So this is Lisa Perez of ODNI. Um, to Keith, April, and Heather, thank you for your great work on the NISPAC and for your collaboration during your tenure. Um, I wish you all uh, equivalent success in your new roles. Also, thank you to Ike for sharing industry perspectives. Much appreciated. And to Jeff, thank you for um, the detailed remarks and uh, answers to all these questions and support for the Trusted Workforce 2.0 initiative. And speaking of Trusted Workforce 2.0, under the initiative, um, ODNI and OPM issued guidance to agencies for how they should collect and report metrics in alignment with the previously issued federal personnel vetting performance management standards. So the guidance will help improve data consistency and reliability across the executive branch. So two key changes include setting substantially more aggressive and aspirational timeliness targets for the end-to-end -end personnel vetting process and establishing a metric measuring the average time needed for agencies to reach an onboarding decision. So the new metrics will be iterative, excuse me, iterative, I cannot say that word, iterative, iteratively <laughs> rolled out based on agency readiness, readiness moving um, toward the full implementation in fiscal year 25. Um, and then on to the next thing I was asked today to speak about the SF-312. Um, so uh, the SF-312 is currently undergoing some updates and is currently going through the DNI approval process. We do not have projected release date right now, um, but I just wanted to make sure that was on your radar. After issuance, I'll provide an overview um, of changes to the NISPAC, and the updated version will be made accessible through our website. So meanwhile, the current version of the form may be digitally signed in accordance with 32 CFR 2001.80, and through coordination with U.S. Uh, General Services Administration, the link from the dni.gov website takes you to the current version of the SF-312 Classified Information Non-Disclosure Agreement that is configured for digital signatures. So when clicking on the link on the GSA webpage, the document will open in web browser view and it will be form fillable. But we've had some questions. So we've learned from these um, questions and emails that some have experienced that they're unable to apply the digital signature in that particular view. If this is the case, I uh, just want to remind everyone, you can save the document from the web browser to your system, and you can reopen it in Adobe Reader. In Adobe Reader, the digital signatures can be applied. Uh, Adobe Reader is downloadable from the same GSA web page. And um, probably through ISOO, I'll provide a copy of this explanation uh, with a screenshot displaying the GSA web page. And then I'll also provide a link to the GSA web page, as well as a copy of the brochure we have uh, prepared 
to provide an overview and answer frequently asked questions regarding the SF-312. And then as a follow-on, once we've actually updated the SF-312, uh, we plan to move on to our 4414 for those of you familiar with it, um, but the, no specifics about that one yet. And that is really all the updates for me today. Are there any questions for me? All right, uh, thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Any questions for Lisa? All right, up next is Mr. Rich DeJosserin, the Deputy Director for the Enterprise Security Programs and Policy of the National Security Services Division with the Office of the Chief Security Officer at the Department of Homeland Security who will provide their update. Rich? Thanks, Heather. Good morning, everyone. Um, I do not have any official updates for the group. However, I do have some information uh, for the group. Uh, the Office of the Chief Security Officer under the Department of Management, I'm sorry, Management Directorate, we have completed our move from 7th and D, Washington, D.C., to the new TSA headquarters in Springfield, Virginia. Uh, Management Directorate now uh, occupies the sixth floor and we are here until further notice and we will also continue in the telework posture um, for the foreseeable future that's really all i have if there are any questions i'm happy to answer all right thanks rich it looks like there's thanks, no Heather. questions from the dhs any questions all right uh Mr. Mike Fowler, a program management specialist with DCSA's NBIS planning and deployment, is now going to provide an NBIS update. Mike? Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, yes, this is Mike Fowler here with the DCSA NBIS uh, planning and deployment office, here to provide a briefing on uh, NBIS uh, this morning. So, appreciate uh, the ability to join here today. Uh, just want to reiterate a couple things that, uh, that Ike mentioned earlier as far as the partnership goes between our our team uh, and our organization and industry, especially the NISPAC team. Uh, we've had a tremendous uh, relationship with those folks over the last year uh, as we've moved forward with NBIS. Um, we meet with, uh, meet with the group uh, multiple times a week uh, to do um, in, to do to do meetings and, and updates and we're also communicating back and forth on a daily basis. So um, getting some great responses back, uh, getting a lot of good information uh, from the industry folks on some of the challenges that they're seeing with the system. Um, we've made a number of strides to get, get folks onboarded uh, here for the, the 1st of October. And you know, just like I said, great partnership. Um, several weeks ago, we actually hosted uh, nine folks from the NISPAC team in Boyers, Pennsylvania at our processing facility, had a two-day session uh, with them, covered a lot of great information about FY24 and how NBIS is going to be rolled out over the next fiscal year, uh, talked about a number of issues and concerns uh, from both, both ends. Uh, and then we also talked a lot about training and communication. So I'm um, going to cover some of that stuff here today. Uh, I did provide a slide deck. If folks want to take a look at that, if you're following along on the slides, we can go ahead and move to slide number three, uh, which is our past, present, and future slide. Just, so just in general, you know, we wanted to cover you know, where we've been, where we are, and where we're going uh, with the NBIS program. So just real quick, uh, where we've been last year, we started – uh, scaling industry companies in March 2023. Uh, the memo from Director Leetsow came out on May 5th to the NISPAC informing industry to complete transition to EAP for case initiation by October 1st. Like I said, extensive communication with the NISPAC team, with our industry partners, get the word out and work with, with industry to get onboarded. So we do have everybody, we do have the majority of of industry onboarded into NBIS now. Uh, we removed the case initiation function in DIS on October 1st. Uh, EAP has officially replaced EQIP as the standard form collection platform. With that, it improves the security, data validation, and user experience. 
And also we're working closely with the Bureau team who has been processing background investigations and CV requests in both Envis and DIS uh, for the time being. Uh, we are continuing to see cases come through on DIS. Uh, we are clearing out that inventory at this point in time. Uh, while there's no new initiations that are being initiated in DIS, you know, we do still have some of those cases that were in progress prior to the first, uh, but we're continuing to see those progress. Uh, right now, we're looking at 99% of case initiations coming through to us via Envis. So, good success story there. And as far as the onboarding piece goes, we do still have a few companies that we're working with. Uh, to make sure that they do get transitioned over to Endus. I think a few of them held off uh, over the last you know, couple of months because they were not planning on initiating any investigation requests or CV requests, um, but we are continuing to track and monitor those folks. We're working closely with our industrial security team who is working with the FSOs at those companies to push out um, the guidance needed for them to onboard. Uh, into the system. So we're continuing to, to progress there. Um, over right now, there is still some you know, swivel chair activities, a uh, common term that we use here, common term uh, that will be used for quite some time here as far as, you know, functions that are available in both this and NBIS. Uh, one of the things that, that recently did come up, uh, we have provided guidance uh, for onboarding personnel and for bringing new folks into the system as far as, you know, actions that need to take place in this versus actions that need to take place in and this, and in some cases, both systems. Um, we've very, very much focused on the initial piece where we're bringing subjects on board, but we also need to focus on, you know, what happens whenever subjects leave a company. Uh, one of the things that came out of the most recent NISPAC group that we had on Monday uh, was to provide some guidance for that. So we're continuing to do that, um, working on that. We'll, as always, we work closely with our POCs on the industry side to make sure that we're providing the right information in an understandable and, you know, and, and effective format. Uh, so that that continues. Uh, I did men I did see that Ike uh, mentioned the reporting uh, issues, and and we agree uh, the reporting issues that have occurred over the last couple months here you know, have been an issue for industry as well as our other customer agencies. Um, the output on those reports is currently capped at 10,000, uh, which is not acceptable for you know, several of our industry companies that have you know, many more employees uh, than that. Uh, our customer agencies fall into the same situation. Some of our large submitters have the same, same issues. So one thing we do want to mention is we are working uh, closely with our solutions team to do two things. Number one, uh, we're working to expand the output from 10,000 to 100,000. Uh, and we are also working on expanding the timeouts to 15 minutes. Uh, the legacy and lag, or I'm sorry, the lag time issues uh, that are coming back from industry, you know, again, unacceptable, need to be, need to be resolved. Um, and we're also, you know, just overall that that feature is expected to be tentatively rolled out in our December release, which is Endis 4.6. So um, we're again working very closely with our solutions team to make that resolution and make sure that uh, that that information is is available to industry and all of our customers. So future, a uh, couple things uh, coming up. First thing, the big big future item that we have for FY24 is going to be subject management. Uh, all of that information uh, and functionality that folks are seeing in this today on the industry side and some of our non-DOD folks are seeing on the CVS side, is going to end up transferring over into Envis this year. Uh, this includes data migration and mapping, as well as the transition to end this as the official system of record. Um, folks will remember whenever we moved from JPAS to this several years ago, there was an official notice that came out identifying this as the system of record. Uh, that same information will come out for for Envis in the future. The date is 
is 100% TBD at this point in time. It's dependent on the functionality of the system and the capabilities involved. Uh, also, internally, uh, we're going to be working quite a few items uh, on the internal side of DCSA. So we're going to be working the background investigation piece, continuous vetting, and adjudications at the DOD at the DCSA CAS. So a lot of information to carry forward there uh, over the next year. Um, 4.4 million data points need to be carried forward. Uh, from our legacy systems, there's 32 system uh, legacy systems that we need to account for and pull forward. Um, one of those, you know, pretty close to, to me here is a prior background investigation uh, employee is PIPS. Um, we have 200 terabytes of data that needs to get carried forward from PIPS uh, into Envis. So. Um, big heavy lift there, a lot of information coming forward, a lot of functionality. You know, some of these systems, for example, PIPS has been around for over 50 years. Uh, it's been, you know, patched over many times, a lot of functionality that needs to come forward. So heavy lift there as well. Um, so we're working, you know, both internally and externally to move forward on, on our systems. If you're following along, uh, let's move on to slide number four. Uh, all about the data. So data that, um, you know, as we move forward, data migration is a key component to all of our, to, to the success of Envis. Uh, so a couple things that we have migrated so far, uh, subject pre-filled data has been pulled forward from eQuip to eApp. So if a subject had a previous investigation request initiated or completed in eQuip, uh, that pre-fill information is going to carry forward. So same as EQIP, um, if you have a reinvestigation or a new request, you log in to the next request, uh, your typewritten information is carried forward and available for you to update the standard form. Uh, you do have to answer the yes-no questions as you did before and make sure that you make any updates as needed. Uh, also, subject affiliation uh, has been pulled forward from this to Envis in September. Uh, we mapped subject data, or we, I'm sorry, we mapped subjects uh, from the system SMOs to the corresponding Envis orgs in September. Uh, this is completed using a flat file at this point. Uh, there was a major push in September that pulled all of the information over actually around 98%, which is actually pretty successful for us uh, when it comes to moving data. There were, the, the remaining 2% has also been resolved at this point in time. And subject affiliation is now present on the subject management tab in Envis. So folks are able to, to go in and see that, uh, that information at this point. Uh, we're continuing to update this information two ways, both information coming back and forth between this and Envis on weekly files. This is expected to continue until real-time update uh, is in place. That's targeted later in calendar year 24, probably the first quarter of the, of the new year. So data to be migrated, a lot of information uh, that's listed on the slide here. No need to really go through it. It, it just kind of covers everything. Basically, in short, anything that's on this at this point in time is going to have to carry forward into Envis. So working very closely with our data team to make sure that we do have the one-to-one -one transition on that uh, and that that information is carried forward into the correct location where our users can see and take action as needed. So a couple actions. Um, for today, uh, as mentioned, you know the swivel swivel chair is still still in play, uh, working back and forth. Some of our um, our customers are going to have to work uh, several items in this, some items in Envis, some items in both. Uh, we do have a number of pieces of documentation and guidance that are out there that we've we've uh, presented uh, to the users. Um, well, primarily, our training materials are available in the STEP system as well as ServiceNow, also known as ESD, um, knowledge articles that are out there for folks to use and gain access to. Uh, so, also uh, on the slide, bottom right, there is a hot link to STEP uh, 
for the IR guide uh, that is available to folks. Uh, certainly, you know, want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to, to take advantage of that and the other documents that are out there in our training site. So if we move on to the next slide, um, one other thing uh, we heard heard from both Ike today and then also from our NISPAC uh, members that joined us up in Boyer several weeks ago was communication. Um, you know, big issue that we had, you know, at least a month ago, as, as recently as a month ago, was that our website, you know, didn't really have a lot of great information on there about Atlas. Um, it's probably one of the biggest um, biggest areas of concern for us uh, over the over the past several years, uh, and it was the information that was on the website was very minimal. So we were working with our Office of Communications and Congressional Affairs team, otherwise known as OCA, and we've been working on the website uh, to add additional information on there. Uh, one of the latest things that came out, you know, several weeks ago was the addition of the Endis tab. So if you go to dcsa.mil, go to the home page on the top top page, you can kind of see it on the slide here. Um, there is an Endis tab uh, that's available uh, to anywhere you are in the system. If you hover over that, you get a drop-down menu, menu that has a lot of information and you know good information for you know all of our customers that are out there we have a federal onboarding link and then we also have uh, information for industry onboarding on there as well uh, a couple things that we've added to that um, first off zero has, has helped us tremendously with adding some additional uh, industry specific documentation that's out there that will help folks with the initiate and review function in the system uh, we also added a hot link in there to provide a redirect to the voice of the industry over the past several months we've been putting a lot of great information out into the voice of industry about updates to end this updates to processing um, it's already available on our website but sometimes you know you have to go through several uh, several locations to get it so um, we added that link on there as well um, we're really looking at this as a springboard to more output uh, in the future a um, couple things that we're looking at uh, in the future term. We're looking at adding releases and updates, uh, versions and hotfixes. You know, we have a new version of Envis that is expected to come out quarterly uh, in the future. Uh, we're also working a number of hotfixes at this point in time. We're working through some weekly hotfixes uh, to try to make certain updates to the system to improve functionality. Uh, something else that will be added on to the overall dropdown is Endis training. Uh, there's going to be a sub page on there. Uh, we've been working very closely with the Endis training team to, to get that information updated and provide quick links um, to, you know, step service now, uh, other locations on our website that have important information uh, for all of our customers. So that information will be coming out. Uh, something else we're working through is to add additional guides and resources. If you look through our website now, a lot of the guides that we have out there relate to EQIP, um, how to fill out my form, how to complete the SF-86. It's very EQIP-centric uh, because that was the system we have been using over the last 20 years. So, you know, what we're working on is, is getting that updated to EAP. So that will continue to go forward. Uh, we're also working uh, dates, updates on the NBIS news page. Uh, we do have some information out there already, so we do have um, we do have that out there. Uh, one thing we do have available on the news and publications is a 927 promotional message uh, from NISPAC, so that is also out there. So more information to come in 2024. I know we're getting close to the 10 minute mark, so I'll just kind of move it along so we can have some questions here at the end. If we go to the last page, one thing we do want to mention, we do have some new contact numbers uh, for our help resources uh, coming up. So uh, the Boyer's phone number, Boyer's phone numbers have changed from a 724 area code to an 878 area code. Uh, this information is on our homepage on dcsa.mil uh, that covers, you know, specific uh, help desk folks. Uh, many industry folks have used the CET and the Applicant Knowledge Center 
over the past several years. We do have new contact numbers for them. Uh, it's listed on the slide here, and it's also listed on our homepage of dcsa.mil. So uh, we certainly hope folks uh, get a chance to use that uh, going forward. And that is it. That is what we have uh, as far as the slides today, and happy to answer any questions anybody has. Hey, Mike, this is Mike. Yes, sir. Hey, Mike, um, I just want to com commend um, your team and DCSA for hearing um, industry. Um, I know that several of us from industry in this pack was part of talking about the enhanced communication. And we really, really appreciate the fact that you heard us, you guys evaluated what needed to be done. And it's great to see that you're taking the steps to ensure that no one is left out uh, in industry. So we appreciate the fact that you heard us and you're putting some of those things to, uh, to uh, some of those things to good use. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, Ike. I, I appreciate the, the I appreciate that very much. And and honestly, you know, from our end as well. I mean, your your input and communication is only helping us and helping the community. So, you know, it's a it's definitely a two way street here. So we we certainly appreciate the the partnership we've had with the team um, in this project. I, I've been in this space for quite some time, and and this is probably the the best partnership I've seen, you know, as far as going back and forth and, and you know, the pace of communication between our, our two groups. So certainly appreciate it and, you know, looking forward to continuing to, uh, to keep improving. Thanks, Mike. Mike, this is Greg Sadler. I got, I got two questions, brief ones, I believe. Um, the first one is when you reference the system of record change, that's it's TBD. Um, from a DCSA perspective, is that TBT, TBD notional 2024 or more confident TBD 2025 fiscal year? Yeah, I, I would not have a, a solid answer for you on that one, Greg. It is um, at this point is just TBD. Um, okay. We're not tracking it um, in any sort of ballpark figure at this point. Okay. No, I appreciate that and completely understand. Um, the, the second one is, is Envis is obviously a bright, shiny, uh, hugely impacting object that DCSA has been chartered to, to roll out. And, and as Ike said, and, and you've reported, it, it's moving and, and the communications improving and et cetera. Does the agency believe that, that it's drawing resources or, um, I'd leave it resources away from the other systems that DCSA is chartered to not only administer and keep alive, uh, but, you know, roll out. We've got NIS, which is, is bumpy, and we, we've all agreed on that in various forums. We've got NCCS, which is in a, a rollout state that's a little delayed. Uh, we've got requirements gathering for for what, what's the acronym NI2 or NIST 2.0, whichever vernacular, are, are there enough resources within the department to manage those priorities? And, and if so, just offer the opportunity to comment on that. Sure, um, thanks for the question, Greg. And, and yes, uh, there, we are working both legacy and, and NBIS at this point. Um, and we, we're going to continue to do so um, for, the, for the immediate future. Um, not seeing a real end date on that. I mean, we do have, you know, decommission uh, actions that are going to be coming out here. They've actually already been posted on, you know, internally on how we're going to, you know, officially transition from one system to another. Um, but we are also keeping those systems in a warm state, you know, as we move forward, I mean, there is still some some data that we can pull from there and things like that uh, that, that need to be accounted for. Um, you're absolutely correct that, you know, while we are going through this uh, swivel chair process between systems, you know, we do need to have, you know, certain functions and fixes, you know, resolved uh, going forward. Uh, we do have teams that are working both sides of that, and we're continuing to do that, and we will continue to do that uh, into the future. 
Thank you, sir. Any other questions for Mr. Fowler from the SPAC members? All right, we will now hear from Mr. Matt Roach, the Division Chief of NIST Operations, Industrial Security for the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency, also known as DCSA. Matt? Good morning, thank you, Heather. And I wanna take a moment to just introduce myself and offer my thanks and recognition uh, to a few folks. So um, uh, first I'd like to thank Keith Minard for his uh, nearly 40 uh, meetings that he's supported and attended, and uh, uh, his his uh, guidance and uh, leadership as as I transition into this new role. Uh, right now, I'm the NISPAC alternate, but uh, he's been kind enough to offer me up as uh, to the director as permanent. Uh, but thank you, Keith, as always, uh, outstanding work. Also, want to welcome Ike. Uh, Ike and I, uh, as so is uh, some of my call, so are some of my colleagues in constant contact, and uh, we will continue to do so. Uh, and I believe um, we can make a lot of progress uh, going forward to continue the momentum that Heather Sims built. I also want to thank Mr. Uh, Bill Leetsow, who's retired from uh, the director uh, position here at DCSA at 40 years of public service. Um, uh, remarkable three years to include the, the COVID uh, period. Uh, and we thank Mr. Leetal uh, uh, for that service, or for his service. Um, and then lastly, uh, just make comment that the Deputy Director, uh, Deputy Director Lecce, who is now our uh, Acting Director, um, has uh, not missed a beat. He's kept us focused on our strategic plan and our top priorities. Uh, and uh, those top priorities uh, in this culture, values, essentially the people aspect of our mission, and then of course integration. Uh, but you can see uh, our strategic plan and read it in, uh, in its entirety online if you're interested in that. But the, the director has uh, made clear that we're sticking to the plan. So um, again, my name is Matthew Roche, and I, I work in the uh, industrial security element here at DCSA. You're going to hear from my counterparts. Um, already heard from Mike Fowler. Great job, Mike. And um, I'll keep my comments brief because uh, uh, a lot of information being put out. I want to make sure Mike Ray has a, a, enough time as well. So. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, first to say thank you to Mr. Spinninger for talking about ISLs. I, I don't have to repeat that uh, uh, those comments, uh, but everyone knows where we are with that. In terms of security reviews, uh, we finished up last year with uh, 3,638, um, and uh, want to thank uh, industry specifically for you know accommodating those security reviews. And it, overall, it's been a good a good year. Uh, looking forward to 24, uh, our expectation is to complete uh, 3,400 security reviews. Um, and uh, in addition to that, um, working on integrating uh, NASOC into the oversight process as well. And we'll, you'll be hearing more about that later. Um, we do have an ongoing uh, working group with, uh, with NISPAC. Uh, we would like to thank them for their service uh, related to our efforts to build a security rating score. Uh, we believe that uh, by working collaboratively uh, on this effort, we'll, we will be able to get uh, more consistent results and overall raise the security posture of the National Industrial Security Program uh, defense industrial base. Uh, secondly, uh, in terms of products, and uh, I want to make clear again that this was uh, one of Keith Miner's efforts, and this was the DCSA Industrial Security began uh, October 1st, uh, sending out an, uh, what we call the annual industrial uh, industry, excuse me, checkup tool to about a thousand facilities a month, and so uh, the idea being that. 
uh, those facilities that were issued a facility clearance in that month would get a friendly reminder on uh, the what we call the checkup tool. So just like as it, you get notices to uh, you know for your annual checkup at the dentist or the doctor or for your car, this the intention here is to focus in on reminding folks of the standards requirements related to uh, the National Health Security Program. So we're we're in our uh, what will be the, our starting our third month here, and uh, we're looking at uh, some really good feedback from industry on that and uh, and getting some good data. Uh, secondly, uh, contractor self inspections. This is another focus area that uh, we internally are uh, focusing in on to increase the number of uh, cert certifications that are uh, uploaded into NIST uh, that validates that the company has completed their self inspection. We also consider this a focus area. Um, to allow for increased uh, compliance, uh, higher security posture um, over time. Uh, as I mentioned with the, the checkup tool, that will obviously be highlighted in there as well. Lastly, CDSC, uh, they continue to churn out some really quality uh, and timely courses. Uh, just want to highlight a couple of those. Uh, one is uh, the CS100. And that's the risk management framework curriculum. You'll hear from Dave Scott in a minute, but uh, essentially this course was uh, focused in on uh, the revision two of the NIST 800-37, and uh, it prepares uh, it, repa it prepares you to focus in on the. Uh, uh, the preparatory process that you go through before you enter into the risk management framework. Uh, so good stuff there. Uh, we also have a SAP course uh, and OPSEC awareness for military members, DOD employees and contractors. And there's also a series of shorts on CUI. Um, so uh, kudos to CDSC. I encourage everyone to check those courses out on their website. Uh, so, uh, pending your questions, that is all I have for now. All right. Thanks, Matt. Any questions from the staff members for Matt? Hey, Heather, this is Ike. Hey, hey again, um, Matt, the cadence that Keith Minor provided um, in Heather's time frame and the, and the cadence that you're providing to sit down with industry NISPAC once a month to suggest collaborate and go over some of these items have been very, very valuable, uh, not only to our team, but to industry. So thank you for, for you and your team and Keith and his team for putting that together so we can sit down and iron out some things. And thank you for listening to us when it comes to the security review process, right? Industry, um, it's been one of those talks every year about the security review. And finally, together, collectively, we're working together as a group to try to figure out and fit and fix and make this best for both sides of, of the ballpark here. So thank you very much for that. I, I couldn't let this meeting go without saying that collaboration is very, very helpful. And we will continue to let the industry know as well, right? We know it because we see it and we work it every day, but it's up to us as well to continue to pass this information down to industry so they can hear it as well and we'll continue to do that so thank you matt thank you. you're welcome mike and uh thank you and uh, just for everyone's edification uh, when we went into covid we started a uh, regular cadence monthly cadence to talk to NISPAC uh, industry and we decided it was so valuable that we would just keep that going so um so the first thursday of every month we get together and uh provide each other updates and uh, things that we can help each other on. So thank you, Mike, for that. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Any other NISPAC members with comments or questions? We are now moving into the portion of the meeting where we get reports from the NISPAC working groups. However, we will be not dis discussing all of the working groups at this time. 
We have provided slides with highlights of all of them. You have already heard from some CSAs and CSOs on the high-level points of what was discussed during the Clearance Working Group on September 6, 2023. We will also hear from DCSA for their security clearance and information system metrics, along with metrics from DOE and NRC. We are now going to hear from Mr. Dave Scott, the NISP authorizing official for DCSA's information systems update. Dave? Thank you for that. Um, so uh, I'm on page two of the metrics that were provided uh, for the NISA working group. This is a national metrics. So I'm not gonna go through each and every one of these, uh, but just wanna kind of call out a few things. Um, our registered systems and EMAS stays uh, steady uh, at around 5,500. I uh, wanna give kudos to industry um, for continuing to uh, work through decommissioning or when, as systems are no longer contracts required um, or expired, uh, continuing that step seven of, of the risk management framework to um, decommission uh, uh, in, in those systems as appropriate. That really helps us keep our, our database cleaned up and our, our accurate number of, of responsibilities within our portfolio. So thank you for that. Um, the other thing that I'll kind of call out here, uh, th these metrics are FY23, is the authorizations process in FY23 is around 2,200. Historically, we've been closer to 2,900, 3,000. Uh, and, and that's in large part because of the packages are, are much better within industry and we're able to get on site at a, at a more aggressive uh, pace in the last year um, and, and doing more full three-year authorizations and reducing our, our conditional authorizations, which, is, which has been a goal of ours. So um, I think that's a, that's a great effort on both industry and DCSA, um, reaching the goal of, of those three-year authorizations um, and reducing a lot of the, the uh, administrative uh, paperwork as, that are as a result from an, uh, the conditional ATOs. Um, and then the, at the bottom there, um, DCSA days uh, for authorization decision. Uh, we, we have been averaging, as you see the 49 there, we averaged between 50 and 55 throughout the, the year. Um, but as the date of this report, it was 49 DCSA days. Um, so we're getting really uh, good uh, battle rhythm uh, moving forward um, with our, with our uh, systems and our goal of reaching a decision within, within 90 days. Um, and uh, our extensions uh, workflows, um, that's a tool in the toolbox of the regional authorization officials, um, in large part working with industry um, it, it, for whatever reasons, we, uh, the, the, uh, the, the right and the ability to create an extension uh, when, when appropriate. Um, so next slide. Uh, working off of a slide three is the triage metrics. This is where the um, contractor staff that are uh, following the job aids that are published um, and, and some metrics on the, the, the first step as we get when we get the packages in through EMAS. Uh, this year, this is a FY23 numbers, uh, we processed about 6,700, um, triage about 6,700 packages, and you can kind of see the breakout there for complete return for rework and, and no triage uh, conducted. The no triage conducted is when um, a package is already passed that, that phase uh, and working directly with the ISSP. We don't want to waste time. That's uh, something that's already been done. So we, we pass that triage and, and uh, go straight to uh, the ISSP when we're already working on, on a package. Um, and the bottom left-hand uh, corner is uh, the top th issues for uh, sent back for rework. Those have been pretty steady, um, and, and those are typically incomplete or um, or, uh, or or are missing information uh, from from the uh, implementation plan or artifacts such as a DD254, uh, et cetera. Uh, workflow is not initiated, so pretty standard there. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner from the triage metrics, uh, one thing that I'll kind of call out um, is the average completion time. You'll see kind of the, the from FY21 through FY23, we've gotten the triage team has, has got a turnaround time of three days. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, the triage team is really starting to understand the RMF process and the expectations, and they're getting very familiar with the system and, and what they're looking at. But two, uh, in large part, because industry is providing a lot better products over the years. Um, and so uh, th that is, uh, I think, outstanding uh, uh, timeline there uh, for that first step, which makes uh, and this, uh, makes our time um, conducting our assessment and, and our risk assessments from a plan review and an on-site review uh, much faster turnaround time. So contributing to that. Um, the other thing that I'll call out is the return for rework. You see that's a little bit high um, than probably normal. It's a 31%, and that's due in large part to EMAS. Uh, releases that we put out there, and then sometimes we change um, some information uh, uh, that is required. So sometimes we, we um, 
it, it, with, through those changes, there's a little bit of an increase in return to rework, but, but no alarm there. That's just, that's, that's kind of normal. And then I'll move on to the final uh, slide there. It's really just two, two topics that uh, are, we've been tracking at a national level in, in close collaboration with the NISA Working Group. Um, and, and I got I should have started with kudos to, to Mr. Sadler and the NISA Working Group team. Um, the, the collaboration over the last uh, and, and couple years has just been outstanding and tremendous uh, in some of the co uh, accomplishments that we've made. Um, and, and I'll highlight a couple of things here um, is, is I'll start with the, the NISP assessment authorization process, job aids and templates. Um, this, uh, this is the, the new name for the DAPM. Um, we, we renamed it to, to more closely align to, to what it really is. It's a job aid and a template. Um, and uh, through this, we've, we've re-indexed or we, we uh, reformatted the document to, to make it easily to identify exactly uh, what a stakeholder would need. If they need to a template on a hardware baseline or a software baseline, they can easily identify that and pull that out. Uh, the NIST connection uh, process uh, guide is within as an index in this as well. Um, that's a, a much anticipated document that what's already been pre-coordinated with the NISA working group. So um, we, uh, the, the document has been um, sent over to the NISA working group and we're uh, currently awaiting comments before we start our formal coordination through the process. So uh, I really want to thank uh, Mr. Sadler and the team for taking the time. Um, I, know it's a, I, know, I know it's a big lift, uh, but we really appreciate you taking the time to kind of take a look at that and let us know your feedback. Um, so look forward to that. Um, and then the NIST cloud capabilities, uh, this, this past year, we've uh, past fiscal year, we've had some great success. Um, uh, we've navigated some challenges, and as you all know, we've we've uh, made some success, and we've authorized a, a, a system within the the, uh, the isolated secret region. Um, we've we've documented um, our success through a job aid that we coordinated with DISA, uh, and that is now available as of a, a, about a month ago within EMAS. So um, it, it it's a it's a high level document, uh, about a two page document that that can help point uh, for industry stakeholders and government stakeholders um, how to uh, request and, uh, and, and kind of the requirements to request a uh, clear uh, contractor, um, isolated secret region environment uh, for assessment authorization through DCSA with the cloud vendor that's authorized. Um, so if there's any interest there, please take a look and give us any feedback that you have as well. Um, but uh, that, that's all I've got pending any questions uh, from the group. that, Dave. All right, we are now going to hear from Mr. Mike Ray, the Deputy Assistant Director of Operations of Vetting, of Vetting Risk Operations with DCSA for their vetting statistics. Mike? All right, so good morning, everybody. Um, first off, just want to kick it off just by saying uh, I always appreciate the collaboration and partnership uh, within this PAC team. So uh, really appreciate that as we walk through different things within this and, and that kind of thing. So. Um, looking at the slide here, so uh, we'll start off on the end-to-end end -end timeliness for T5 initials. Um, this is for FY23 uh, Q4. Um, 20 days for initiation, uh, 134 days for investigation, and 16 days for adjudication, so that end-to-end -end time is 170 days. Um, for T3 initials, FY23 Q4, um, it's going to be 18 days for initiation, 62 days for investigation, 20 days for adjudication. Um, that end-to-end -end timeline is 100 days. 90% um, of all initial investigations uh, had to enter termination made within 7 to 10 days. Um, if you look at the chart on the top left, uh, that shows the current adjudications inventory at 2,400. Um, and then the chart on the right shows the total investigation inventory for T5s is at 18,500, T3s at 18,300. Um, and you can see the breakdown of the total adjudication inventory. T5 is at 400, the T3 is at 1,500. Um, for reciprocity, I uh, certainly appreciate the comment earlier today by uh, Jane. Uh, the, the CAS continues to deliver the reciprocity decisions at an average of one calendar day. Um, for industry conditionals, uh, we coordinated between VRO, the NISPAC, and the DOD CAS um, and identified the process to issue conditional national security eligibility determinations. Uh, these conditional support mission readiness by removing a case from due process and using continuous vetting uh, to monitor compliance and support risk mitigation. 
Uh, DOD CAS plans on beginning to issue the conditionals in Q1 FY24. Um, the industry-specific communication materials are currently being finalized. Um, we, we did share that uh, within this PAC team, received some comments and just finalizing that. And as soon as that's completed, we'll distribute that out to industry and across the department once available. Um, for the DOD CAS call center, so as part of identifying synergies between VRO and DOD CAS, uh, the DOD CAS call center started answering inquiries from industry on PCL VRO statuses on October 1. The DOD CAS call center phone number is 301-833-3850. And then uh, transition over to CV alert management. So post CV enrollment, um, alerts are generated on, based on established thresholds which align with the federal investigative standards and adjudicative guidelines. Um, CV is impactful as we average a 6% alert rate. Um, criminal and financial are the most common valid actionable alerts. Uh, thus far in FY23, VRO received 28,000 industry alerts of which 13,500 or 48% were not previously known, and that's from 22,000 unique industry subjects. Um, just note that this information should have been self-reported, and as we know, our goal moving forward is to have individuals self-report information um, as it occurs. And uh, that's all I have for the group, and I'll uh, pause here for questions. Thanks, Mike. Any questions for the BRO with DCSA from the PAC members? All right, we're now going to hear from Ms. Natasha Sumter, the Program Planning and Management Lead with the Office of Security Policy, Department of Energy. Please provide your message. Thanks, Natasha. Thank you, Heather. Good morning, NISPAC members and participants. As always, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to provide the Department of Energy's policy updates and updates on our personnel security investigations process, metrics, and timelines. On behalf of Mr. Mark Honoski and Mr. Tracy Kendall, thank you for giving the Department of Energy the floor. The Office of Insider Threat Program just broke ground on rewriting DOE Order 470.5 entitled Insider Threat Program. Just two weeks ago, the Insider Threat Program formed an integrated project team working group that is reviewing the current order to identify focus areas and priorities. If all goes well, with this aggressive timeline, they anticipate publishing the new order before next fall. The department continues making progress with rewriting DOE Order 470.4B entitled Safeguards and Security Program. The directive is being superseded by two new orders, Safeguards and Security Program Planning and Safeguards and Security Program Management Operations. The latter of the two impacts industry most of all. That's where we have our facility clearance, foci, <clears throat> excuse me, and other NISP-related activities um, outlined. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm so sorry, guys. I'm recovering from a sinus infection, so I am still a bit nasally. So continuing on, the two drafts are being developed via the integrated project team process as well, and both teams have developed and are reviewing their drafts and preparing to coordinate the drafts for departmental review. We will continue to provide updates via this forum as we meet milestones that impact the greater community. Now on to the slides. So I'm providing this update on behalf of Tracy Kendall from the Office of Departmental Personnel Security. A special thanks goes out to DCSA for providing the metrics that I will discuss. So on to slide two. Overall, DOE continues to meet the ERPTA goals and average over the past four quarters with an average of 10 days for initiation and 17 days for adjudicating the investigations. On slide three, DOE continues to exceed the average initiation and adjudicative goals for the year. And as you can see on slide four, we met and exceeded the initiation and adjudication goals over the past year. 
On slide five, over the past four quarters, DOE continues to meet average initiation and adjudication goals, but did have a few bumps in the road um, during the past winter. We expect the trends over the past, over the last five months of this year to continue. On slide six, overall, DOE continues to meet the ERPTA goals on average over the last four quarters with an average of seven days for initiation and 10 days for adjudication. And as always, if our industry partners have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out and we are ready to assist. Thank you for this opportunity and I can see the floor back to Heather. All right, thank you. Are there any questions for the Department of Energy? All right, Mr. Chris Hiley, Chief Personnel Security Branch with NRC, please provide your update. Good morning, everybody. This is Chris Heilig from the NRC. Um, I really don't have any, or the NRC doesn't have any updates uh, this time around. Um, I wasn't going to go slide by slide, but if you take a look, um, overall, we're meeting our adjudication timeliness numbers. Um, and I'm happy to report that our personnel security office is now fully backfilled with FTEs. So we fully anticipate to continue hitting those targets, if not improving on those numbers. Um, we are fully compliant with the Trusted Workforce Initiative and um, ramping up um, enrollment of the non-sensitive population. Um, that's really all I have for you this time around, and I'm, but I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thanks, Chris. Any questions for the NRC? All right, now we will hear from Mr. Perry Russell Hunter, the Director of the Defense Office of Hearings and Appeals, also known as DOHA. Thank you, Heather. Uh, this is uh, Perry Russell Hunter, and uh, I can promise that my uh, update will be brief because it is all good news. Uh, the established administrative process for uh, industry Clearance eligibility um, continues to uh, perform as designed, and um, this is for not just DOD industry contractors, but for the industry contractors for 32 other federal departments and agencies. Uh, currently in legal review, uh, we have 322 statements of reasons. Uh, that is a normal workload, and so what that means is that we are current in terms of the legal reviews of the statement of reasons, which is the notice document. It is how uh, the uh, DOD CAS and, and DOHA inform uh, the individual of the security concerns. Um, and so that's, it's very important that those get out timely and, and we are timely on all of those. Um, we completed um, 2,164 uh, legal reviews of statements of reasons in fiscal year 2023. Again, that is a, a normal amount. Uh, what this tells us is that uh, while uh, CECV is allowing um, us in the government to get to uh, the adverse cases faster, uh, in the past I've used the analogy of uh, finding the needles in the haystack faster. We may have made the haystack slightly bigger with CECV, but we're also finding the needles faster. Um, and that at least based on the numbers we're seeing, uh, that isn't uh, creating a, a significantly larger number of denials or revocations. We're just getting to them faster. Um, as, the, uh, as Mike noted uh, on behalf of the, the CAS, um, the uh, commencing the use of conditionals, uh, conditional grants of eligibility by the CAS is something that we at Doha fully support. Um, and we've uh, spoken about this at past NISPACs uh, because this will not only uh, reduce risk and improve, uh, enhance national security, uh, it will also enhance readiness by enabling people to, um, to get to work or stay at work. Uh, where the the issue um, bears monitoring and CECV allow for that, um, but we can we can let the person continue to work. So uh, the the move to conditional eligibility for uh, industry is a, a great improvement by the CAS, and, and we applaud the CAS for 
uh, stepping into that realm. It's one of the reasons why uh, I continue to predict that the number of denials or revocations we see um, should remain fairly constant. But speaking of getting to adverse cases faster, uh, Doha is leveraging uh, MS Teams uh, to conduct uh, more hearings by uh, remote video. In, in fact, for the first time ever, Doha is now holding more hearings over uh, Teams than in person. Um, but Doha's uh, independent administrative judges are uh, still uh, able to uh, convene in-person hearings uh, whenever and wherever we need to, um, in, in fairness to the individual, uh, or where the, the case calls for it. Um, generally, that is with uh, multiple or more complex witness testimony or more complex issues or uh, where credibility is a, a central issue. Uh, to the extent that uh, Doha's independent AJs are um, in the spotlight, uh, probably the, the biggest news for them is that all of Doha's administrative judges and appeal board members um, have now been appointed as constitutional officers uh, by Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. Um, this is uh, the result of a uh, series of Supreme Court cases in which uh, the Supreme Court determined that making these kinds of um, independent decisions, particularly after fact-finding hearings, uh, require constitutional appointment. And so um, Doha has done that. Um, Secretary Austin has appointed each of our administrative judges and appeal board members. Um, and again, this is to uh, enhance their uh, independence and accountability. Um, with that said, um, I, uh, I now yield the rest of my time back for any questions. All right, thanks, Perry. It sounds like we don't have any questions. Um... We are now at the point of the meeting where we ask for NISPAC members to present any new business they have. Anybody? Heather, this is Greg Sadler. It, it's not new business. I just wanted to loop back to the, the NISA working group content from mm -hmm. Dave Scott. Uh, I was fighting the mute button and, and failed. Um, I, I, all, all the points that Dave may mentioned regarding the cloud capability and the, the engagement with industry are, are spot on. And we appreciate that some of the bumps that the team experienced during the pilot are being worked through and um, to, to smooth out that process and take the feed, the continued feedback on how to make the, um, the replication of the cloud solutions easier for both industry and the government. Um, the, the DAPM replacement, uh, we expect to have content or comments back to Dave and his team uh, by the end of the month, that's our goal to to provide that feedback. Uh, we do one item that's already on the surface is come up with a better name. The DAPM flowed very easily. Uh, this one is is a bit of a uh, full mouth to, to get out. Um, and then the one item that that Dave's team is already working on, and we hope that the DAPM replacement and updates will, will further contribute to is consistency across the field, um, and both at the um, AO level is, is greatly improving, but down at the individual IS, ISSP level, uh, Dave and his team have taken uh, initiative to try to drive more consistency there. Um, it's definitely needed as, as the field deals with multiple locations within a single company and conflicting guidance. Um, but again, Dave's team uh, has demonstrated ownership in that and, and they're working with us and, and we're providing that feedback in where where possible. Thanks, Greg. So, yeah. Any other next oh, Sorry, go ahead. No, thank you, Heather. Thanks. Do any other NISPAC members have any questions or remarks before we close out the meeting? All right, in the interest of time, we're not going to uh, take any more participant questions, but please ensure that questions and comments uh, were sent via WebEx's chat feature or email to NISPAC at NARA.gov so that they can be answered. As a reminder, all NISPAC meeting announcements are posted in the Federal Register approximately 30 days before the meeting, along with it being posted to the ISU Overview blog. Our next NISPAC is scheduled for May 1st, 2024. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Bye-bye.